So we're here again with Dr. Robert J. Lifton, renowned psychiatrist and my mentor, who helped save me, I believe, in terms of my understanding of what had happened to me in my own cult. And these are some books of drawings called Birds and Psycho Birds. And um, that's my absurd underbelly. And it just shows your humor. I'm looking for, is there anyone? The future belongs to us. Are you sure we want it? <laughs> I'm just picking by random. We must build more weapons to keep the peace. Who will keep the weapons? <laughs> On the basis of your careful research study, would you say that it is possible to have an identity? I could not do more than speculate on that problem. <laughs> anyway, any more birds in the future? Doctor left them by uh, the chance. They, they have to emerge on their own, so to speak. But <laughs> yes, I'm not finished with them. Okay, good. Or they with me. Okay, good. Great. So there was a disturbing new book on. Patricia Hurst by, I think, Jeffrey Tubin. Um, and um, I know that I, you testified on her behalf, I, I did, believe. Yeah. I wonder if you can comment. Well, w what I testified in the Patricia Hurst case was that she was put through an extremely crude thought reform-like process. Mm -hmm. It wasn't at all systematic the way the Chinese communists did it, or even to the extent that uh, many cults in the United States might mm -hmm. uh, go about it, trying. But it, she was, after all, kidnapped and put down in a closet for some weeks. So it's February and, 1974 for all the young people who yeah. may not know the story. Yeah, the she young heiress, and she was threatened, and uh, she had uh, an avenue of guilt, being a Hearst a daughter of ex extremely rich mm -hmm. family and privileged mm -hmm. and a family that had been rather reactionary in mm -hmm. a political sense and had done lots of dubious things uh, mm -hmm. over the course of uh, uh, a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So the, and the group that she was kidnapped by called the Symbionese Liberation Army, SLA, consisted of about 10 or 15 people. Right. Micro cult. A, a grandiose kind of cultic group mm -hmm. and it had a charismatic leader right. uh, who was black and there was a lot of easy white guilt toward blacks that was uh, uh, exploited. Mm -hmm. And certainly Patricia Hurst was vulnerable mm -hmm. given her background, her family and, and perhaps the stage of her life where she was at the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, she could, under pressure uh, of this kind, she could come to internalize uh, convictions and attitudes and even join in a bank robbery. Mm -hmm. uh, things that she would never have dreamt of doing without this thought reform like crude kind of coercive. Pressure. Mm -hmm. They even gave her a name, or she took the name Tanya, I believe. That's right, Tanya. So a different, a different name to become a different person. Mm -hmm. um, there could be legal arguments. One could argue that she she should never have been tried, mm -hmm. uh, but rather one could have looked at she, something. She, she since she joined in a bank robbery that could be seen as a, a guilty act under extreme mitigation. Right. Uh, and, and in that case, not tried. So there are legal arguments in terms of where the case might or should have gone. Mm -hmm. But the idea that we could put no significance on the kind of process to which she was subjected uh, is simply uh, untrue mm -hmm. and, and uh, doesn't, doesn't really fit with what we know psychologically from so many other situations. Uh, in a way, the psychological uh, understanding, and there were several other psychiatrists who, who testified and psychologists, uh, 
that psychological understanding was probably not entirely wasted because although she was convicted, mm -hmm. she lost the case. And that was partly because her lawyer, Bailey, didn't really conduct the case as effectively as he should have. Right. Uh, he didn't even do the brainwashing defense, he, he, did he? He, he, he half did it. Uh -huh. He had both a brainwashing and a gun at the head defense. Mm -hmm. The gun at the head defense wasn't sufficient mm -hmm. because she didn't run away when nobody, at times, and nobody was watching her right. when she could have. Right. So she had to have internalized something. Right. But you can't claim both defenses right. without their canceling out each other. And that's what more or less he, he tried to do. In any case, she was convicted, but she was eventually pardoned. Mm -hmm. And I think the psychological testimony that took note in a psychological way of what she had been subjected to was over the long term useful yeah. in her being pardoned. Uh -huh. so. so I was asked by the Department of Justice for the National Amber Alert Conference to talk about why Elizabeth Smart and J.C. Dugard, who had both been kidnapped and both had been with their captors and given a new identity, why they didn't run away, or why when the police had them, they kept saying, that's not me, you think I'm somebody else, but that's not me, mm. when it was really them. Yeah, yeah. So I explained the dual identity right. and I explained breaking down the core sense of self and indoctrination and and uh, everybody in the room thought it made a lot of sense. Yeah. So yeah. We, we've on some levels made some progress, but on other levels I think the general public still doesn't understand. The, uh, the Patricia Hearst case um, became a vast media show mm -hmm. uh, and also an arena of great ambitions. Mm -hmm. There was F. Lee Bailey and his ambition, known as the greatest defense lawyer. He can get anybody off. And the district attorney had political ambitions in convicting her. In a way, her not being tried would have been the most humane approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and then some sort of revelation of what she'd been through and what psychologically that could entail. Uh, but there was too much ambition mm -hmm. and too much media excitement mm -hmm. on the, you know, in that whole case for that to happen. And so because she was of a wealthy family, if they didn't apply justice, then it would have looked like they were giving special favors? Yes, there was uh, a lot of hostility toward her as the daughter of an extremely privileged and wealthy family. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, we always are suspicious of the offspring of privilege, mm -hmm. uh, often with good reason, mm -hmm. but in this case, uh, misdirected because she had been uh, kidnapped and, and brutalized. So what I'm hoping in the near future is a new model by Alan Shefflin, who's a law professor emeritus from Santa Clara. He put together and published for the first time in 2016 a social influence model that could potentially be used in courts of law that helps to identify vulnerabilities in the target individual specifically qualities and attributes of the predator or the organizational uh, guru leadership qualities of narcissism and sociopathy, etc. But then using your model and my model, which is based on your model, uh, and breaking down the specific elements of the controlling the environment, controlling language, the inculcation of black and white and perfect and unperfect and use of guilt and shame, all of these criteria. And the dispensing of existence. And, and the dispense, which is the ultimate, the, you know, you're, you're in and you deserve to live, and if you're out then you can be killed or you have no rights at all, which by the way, so many cult groups will say to their members, if you leave us, then none of your family can talk to you because you're a non-person, yeah. you're an apostate. Yeah, yeah. So they do yeah. ritual shunning, disfellowshipping, etc. And 
it's a discrimination yeah. of people's basic human rights, especially if you were born in one of these groups and you love your mother and your father and your sister and your brother and you just don't believe in the doctrine anymore, you don't believe in the headquarters, but they define you as being subhuman, that you're not... Yes, that's right. Human status exists only in relation to the cult. Right. Um, and without it, it's... Uh, taken away from one. Right. So I guess if you were if you were on the stand defending someone who was a victim of undue influence and thought reform and the judge was saying, Dr. Lifton, so are you saying that people, intelligent people, can be deceived and manipulated to adopt a whole nother identity that, and do things that are antisocial? You would say intelligent people are adopting other identities and doing things that are antisocial all the time. Uh, it's, it's not a new combination and it's useful to learn about these manipulative uh, processes and to give them some recognition. And uh, the legal system has to contend with these, but I would acknowledge that it's a difficult question mm -hmm. because there are gradations yes. and you can't just equate uh, elements of coercion or uh, influence with uh, non-culpability. Right. So one has to have standards of legal culpability but one has to understand how people can be changed by coercive methods. Right, so in the case of Patricia Hearst, if I had my say, I would have, and she did go to trial, I would have said she's guilty, but not sending her to jail, maybe sentencing her to 2,000 hours or 10,000 hours of community service, explaining what happened to her to prevent other people from getting influence to do illegal things. That's right. That's where, that's where our legal system has to expand in a humane direction. It does sometimes. Uh, the, I used to testify during the Vietnam War and in uh, terms of anti-nuclear groups on behalf of some protesters including the Berrigans in there oh. uh, pouring blood on nuclear weapons or uh, or on draft records uh, and I try but usually the courts would limit my testimony to the sentence hearings mm -hmm. but at least I could say what the general atmosphere was mm -hmm. and why they embarked on this behavior what they meant to convey mm -hmm. by these symbolic acts uh, and that could have some significance in terms of how they were sentenced. Mm -hmm. So in that way the court system, I mean there are one or two cases where one had receptive judges where they allowed this kind of testimony in at the main court procedure mm -hmm. and we could make progress. Mm -hmm. But um, the court, that, that's an example of slightly expanding uh, capacities of the legal system in a mm -hmm. humane direction and we do need more of that. Right. So, um, I, I've taken up a lot of your time. I'm wondering if there's anything else you'd like to, any other messages that you'd like to uh, have on the internet forever, potentially. The, um, maybe the other thing I would come back to, just very briefly, mm -hmm. what I started to say before, um, there's a danger in what I'm coming to call malignant normalization. Mm -hmm. I put it forward in the most extreme way in regard to the Nazi doctors mm -hmm. uh, I, and mentioned Americans who polluted in torture where that became a normal kind of behavior or the environment normalized torture mm -hmm. and that's a sad moment in American experience where that was the case. Mm -hmm. uh, Fortunately, we've taken some steps to uh, change that, but other groups can normalize destructive behavior. And even now in the election, one candidate, Donald Trump, is trying to normalize 
the ignoring of truth. Yes. That's a very extreme normalization. So that what actually happens is not taken into account, but rather what one says happens, or what one says one believes to be, in this case, uh, uh, an often uh, uh, wildly false kind of idea, mm -hmm. uh, has to be the source of all uh, reality. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's an ignoring of what we've worked so hard to achieve a sense of what Erickson called actuality mm -hmm. in terms of the environment around us and to uh, I think there's now a reaction it's been very belated mm -hmm. slow in coming mm -hmm. but there's now a reaction to this very radical effort at malignant normalization mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we have to be on guard against it here and in other places too. Right, this kind of, uh, as you were saying earlier, the guru, trust me, I got this, I know what's best. Yeah. No plan, no policy, just trust me, and a redefinition of what the facts are. Trump said very specifically, I'm the one who best understands the system, so only I can fix it. Yes. That was a uh, Demagoguery. Yeah, it, it's a total insertion of self, uh, or let me put it this way, it's a merging of self and world, mm. in which there's no world outside the self. Mm. Isn't that the definition of a narcissist? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lifton, thank you for all of your amazing contributions to, to me, to the planet, and uh, Live long and keep writing. I'm trying. Keep speaking, please. Thank you.